You've attended council hearings in person. You've tuned into our televised proceedings on channel 13. Now you have the chance to listen to us on the radio as we demystify our work and the people who do it. This is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council with your host, Josh Gibson. Thank you, deep voice person with a funky backbeat. Indeed, <laughs> this is not a council hearing. This is hearing the council. You can't have a government without a council, so you can't have a government radio station without a council show. This is it. I'm Josh Gibson, Director of Communications for the Council. You might also know me as the Council's voice on social media at Council of DC. Um, Without any further ado, I want to welcome back uh, Councilmember uh, Janice Lewis George of Ward Four for her uh, her second appearance on the show. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I'm I'm happy to be here. Glad to have you. After the first one, you you never know if they're coming back. But generally, <laughs> if they do two, the you know the hooks in them, and you you know they'll be back again. So honestly, uh, thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are. Uh, well, the topic um, today uh, we're going to hit one possibly two topics depending how we how we go on the first one um but the first topic the main topic is going to be the green new deal for housing uh so why don't you uh tell us all about it okay so the green new deal for social housing um is uh an opportunity for us to create real affordable housing um, in the district, sustainable affordable housing that truly meets our affordable housing needs. Um, so it creates social housing and social housing is DC owned mixed income housing um, in which we um, basically make sure that we have the, affordab the affordability um, requirements set there. So you'll have a third of the uh, buildings will be um, deeply affordable housing. Um, then you have a third that will be very affordable housing. Uh, and then the third are at market rate. And the market rate helps subsidize the affordability in the rest of the building, um, which is something that we know um, is possible. Um, we've seen this social housing model uh, in uh, as far as Vienna, but as as near as our you know our uh, neighbors in Montgomery County, uh, California are all moving towards a model, and it's really based on the fact that we need how we need more affordable housing, um, and we can't just rely on the market to produce it. Right. Now I did notice uh, you used in the bill um, the term social housing is used, mm -hmm. um, but my understanding is what distinguishes it is it's publicly owned housing. So what distinguishes social housing from public housing? Well, I, I see them, they're two completely different things um, okay. because of the fact that social housing, while, uh, while DC owned, is uh, one, is mixed income housing. Um, and so in, historically, public housing is concentrated poverty, uh, concentrated, low, uh, deeply affordable housing is there. Um, but we know, um, you know, Statistics tell us, science tells us that when we concentrate poverty, we just create more issues and more cycles um, that result from poverty. So social housing really is a model based on mixed uh, mixed income uh, housing. Social housing also is different in the respect that it really um, puts the profits and the powers in the hands of, of the people. And so because social housing is publicly owned, instead of surplus rent going to developers, we invest those funds to lower rents for tenants and create more affordable housing across the city. Um, what also makes it different is affordable housing allows us to couple um, some of our other sort of needs in the city with it. So uh, it gives us an opportunity to put housing near transit which we know is a great thing. When we put deeply affordable, very, very affordable housing near transit, it allows for our everyday workers to be able to get to and from very easily. Um, it allows people to not rely on cars um, for, for their mode of travel. And so it gives us the ability to uh, prioritize areas near transit. It also gives us uh, the ability to put things within it. Uh, retail at the bottom, when we say retail, we mean things that we know we need like grocery stores. Um, it allows us to put child care centers. Um, so it really is uh, a model that is is based on addressing more than just the housing need, but really the, the whole community need of, of what uh, people need to, to do well, to thrive um, in, in a community. 
And talk about the, you'd mentioned the one third, one third, one third yeah. income mix. Is that a sort of a tested and proven model? You know, can you, could you turn the knob a little, have a little less market rate and mm -hmm. still have the benefit of mixed or t tell me how you ended up at that? Um, yeah, so we, we met with um, a few uh, developers um, and researchers, and um, obviously you can move around that third as long as, the key is you have to have enough to subsidize the affordability within the rest of the building. Um, but what we found is the third of all the units being deeply affordable, which is for families making 30% of the median uh, income or less, um, a third being uh, very affordable, which is the families making 50% median income or less, and then the third of apartments being market rate allow um, is, is a model that that will has worked and will work and you can sort of mix within there you can go further up on the deeply affordable if you go higher on the third of the market rate. Gotcha. And in similar projects has there been um, success filling the market rate third? I, I would think that all good-hearted people would not have a, any issue with being among that third would be grateful to be in a project like that. But I just wonder if that's, uh, if that's ever been an issue or a concern. Um, it's not an issue that I know of um, that that has come up, um, and we we haven't heard of any of those issues. But I know, um, you know, we had uh, the Green New Deal for Housing um, hearing, and we had 154 witnesses, and a lot of witnesses, you know, got on there and said, I would love to be able to, to do this and be a part of something like this. Um, and then it really is the area. So when we think about Ward 3, an area that has what, I think they're at, at seven uh, up to 17 grocery stores at this point. Um, and, and they're near transit. They're right between, you know, um, uh, what Tinley Town, American AU, and then, you know, all the way to Chevy Chase. So they're near transit. That's an area where anyone would want to live. Um, it has grocery stores, it, um, tons of grocery stores. It has amenities uh, nearby and it has, and, it, and it's near, near next to transit. So it, as long as you're in, I think, believe in, in areas where people want to live, they're going to choose it as an option. And I, I think we we rightly put a, t uh, a ton of emphasis on racial diversity in our city. And I think we sometimes forget that it's so valuable for folk to, folks to experience economic diversity, income diversity as well. I think there's just so many lessons that can be learned by everyone, by being living with folks that, that have a different economic um, background. Yeah, um, I think absolutely. that's an, an additional benefit of this. Absolutely, um, and that's why I think DC is a, a great location for for us for us to really be premier for social housing. We we are a city of diverse uh, backgrounds, diverse mixed uh, incomes, um, and we do benefit from from that diversity. You know, I I'm a DC native. I went to you know various schools and uh, diverse schools, um, and it always improved who you know improved the outcome of who we become as as, as adults. Um, and so I do think we would benefit from having you know, living in di diverse communities as well as in diverse housing. Uh, now, you mentioned, uh, touched on one point I know is one of the reasons, but what makes the, the Green New Deal for housing green? Right. So each new building will have net zero emissions. Um, and feature sustainable design and technology throughout the property, including all electric heating, um, all electric appliances, so stoves, because we know stoves are fire hazard. We've seen what has happened to our neighbors in Tacoma twice recently. There have been fires because they're still relying on um, gas stoves. Um, the minimal off-street parking uh, requirements, um, and then solar power whenever whenever possible. And then also, as I talked about before, it being transit-oriented. And so I think this is vital to confronting our climate change, which is an existential threat to our communities and to our planet. Um, and I think beyond our, our climate, there are environmental harms like pollution and safety hazards like gas stoves that we can address by building um, green social housing as well. Uh, now, uh, from looking through the legislation, it seems like there are two potential avenues for acquisition of properties to become social housing. Yeah. One is conversion of, I'm guessing, surplus government property. Correct. And then the other is uh, pure uh, purchase. That's right. So can you talk a bit about, is there kind of a mix, a percent of one versus the other that you're anticipating or... Um, how, how do you think the property will get in the pipeline for this? 
Well, we already have surplus properties happening. You know, we we just had what three three or four dispositions at our legislative meeting on Tuesday. Um, right. So we know we are disposing, uh, doing dispositions of of properties now. And so, uh, what this legislation requires us to do is, um, under this bill, the mayor would be required to explain why giving each piece of land to developers would produce more affordable housing. Uh, then could be done with social housing before that housing can be given away. So it really also pushes us to meet our affordable housing goals um, in a very real way. I see it as a mixture. Obviously, there's going to be spaces where we're going to purchase, we're going to purchase and build housing. I'm thinking next to Tacoma Station in Ward Four, we're doing housing there. When I talk about building pl places next to transit, we should absolutely be taking those properties. But then we have things like the Wardman Hotel in Ward Three that everyone's been talking about, where we as a city could purchase the Wardman. It's in a in, in a, a great location near transit, near grocery, near so many amenities. Um, it's an opportunity for social housing and a place where people want to live and would come and live, uh, no matter sort of, um, you know, which which rate they would they were be, they would be at. So I, I see it as a mix. We have so many. We have disposition properties, and we also have property. We have spaces, land that we can also just you utilize um, to to build. Uh, you know, housing. So um, I know in Ward 1, there is an old uh, police station and an old fire engine. Um, we did a disposition last year uh, with the um, Georgetown when we purchased the, uh, what was it, the gas station, right? Um, right? Right. So those are space, those are things where I think we can be proactive in purchasing uh, land and property near um, transit, but then also taking some of our property, like some of the old firehouses we're not using, um, and things of that nature, and and utilize that to to create. So I, I see it as a mix in both, and I think we have the opportunity to do a lot with that. Now I know in uh, the law we have had going back, you know, fifteen plus years, we've had the uh, District Opportunity to Purchase Act, which was a bill uh, Marion Barry had introduced mm -hmm. um, with exactly the purpose of purchasing property that was available and making it available for housing. I know that uh, there's been a struggle putting that into uh, implementing that, that the council amended it, amended the regulations to try to get it more um, active. How do you think this uh, compares or can complement that uh, existing legislation? Yeah, I, I think it's complementary and sort of I thought about it when creating, um, when, when doing the research and uh, creating social housing, it came up. Um, so I do think it's it's a complementary piece. Um, and I think we're both, we're trying to get to the same issue. We're trying to get at the crux of the, uh, solving the same the same issue. Yeah, I just, I, it just seems like such a no brainer that, that sometimes owning the property, if there's good property, like you said, the, the uh, Wardman Hotel in Ward 3, if it's a super good location, it's pre-built, it's dense, it's on top of transit that's a golden opportunity instead of finding a site, mm -hmm. building design, you know, um, but yet it's something that seemingly the city struggled to do um, at yeah. certainly at scale. So yeah. um, what, how do you think the, um, the surplus properties are, we already, already belong to us, but for the purchases, how do you think the funding will end up? Uh, you know, working? the way I see it, we already have, what is it? 500 million in the housing production trust fund that we're utilizing. So I think one of the things that di differs, we didn't have the housing production trust fund um, back then. And it's been one of the, the, the key things that uh, Mayor Bowser has really invested in and, and, and been in sure to make sure we have a robust housing production trust fund. So the way I see this is we have the production trust fund for this very purpose. And so um, I think it gives us the opportunity to make um, some smart purchases, uh, some of the, you know, and, and weighing how we're going to use the funding. Um, but I think there, there's a lump sum there that we can really work with and we continue whenever uh, the city uh, has a surplus in funds, we a percentage goes in the housing production trust fund and, and we're, we're still on that trajectory of, of having uh, surplus funds. And so I think continuing to put those funds in the housing production trust fund um, is, is the way we do this. We use that, we use that fund to actually create what it's set up for, which is true affordable housing. Um, and I think what makes this better, and another thing I always say is that when we give the land to a developer, at the end of the day, they have to factor in profit. 
I mean, there's no reason for doing something if you're not going to get a profit. So they have to center sort of profit and making a profit at the center of this, where if we own it as, as the city, we don't have to center profit. We center, we can center people. And so we have enough funding to maintain and, and make sure we keep the upkeep and do all those things. But we don't have to factor in that profit piece. We also have the ability to not, uh, you know, property tax wise uh, to, to really adjust the, the property taxes to social housing in, in, in the way we see fit. So we don't have to worry about the property taxes and we don't have to worry about the profit. And I think that's it's a huge benefit for us to do to do that um, because we don't have to, we we have the added benefit of not having to worry about those things. Right. And when, and I don't know the answer to this, the, when housing production trust fund money is spent, is the bill, if it, if it passes in the future, is it still subject to appropriations or because that money is already sitting out there? Good. Is that already, uh, does it still need to be appropriated to a bill like this? Uh, there would probably be a cost in setting up the office of, of social housing um, oh, and yeah. development. So, but the rest of it, but the rest of the funds would, uh, would, would come from the housing production trust fund. And then how I would I would be curious how when properties are purchased, how the the pricing um, is figured out, because if the government's underbidding, it's never going to win properties. And if it's overbidding, there's going to be a uh, potential for um, complications, because how are we deciding what properties mm -hmm. to buy um, yeah. and who's getting that that premium if the government is paying right. Um, that that's not specific to this bill. That's a broad yeah. question. But I, I just wonder how is that dealt with to to keep that fair and uh, efficient. Well, I think you know, I think a lot of those details will be worked out. But the the idea would be the office um, of social housing sort of development with experts who can sort through those issues. And so that's a part that's part of the reason why someone's like, well, we need office of social housing instead of putting them within uh, current structures is because we want to make sure um, we are actually going to be able to assess correctly whether we're spending too much or not uh, or not enough. Um, and we do it already. I mean, we negotiate, uh, you know, cost of properties all the time. We did it last budget with the with the Georgetown um, gas station. Um, so we're going to obviously, you know, bid on properties and, and try to get the best bang for our buck. Um, but I think right now, since we're giving away properties for a dollar and 99 year leases, um, ground leases, I think there is some room there um, <laughs> as far as uh, how much, you know, with, with, with our own surplus properties, we can save a lot just with, with retaining our surplus properties now. Definitely. Um, now, is this something that you would see rolling out on sort of a pilot basis or going sort of straight to full scale, whole hog, uh, as big as it gets? Well, I want to do, I want a pilot to happen as soon as possible. Um, I want, um, I, I, I do want that to happen. And I want, um, you know, probably we'll work next session to see what we can do um, through, through budget or, or, you know, through, you know, imminent domain, essentially to make that happen. Um, so I, I, it's not something I'm thinking like, oh, we're going to go full throttle and, and put it out. I do think we need to see a model of it work, but I do think we have to, that, that, that process is going to be urgent. Um, so I would like us to, um, be urgent in, 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 in making sure we roll it out. I think the urgency of our displacement crisis demands that once a bill is passed, we should be rolling it out citywide so that we can start meeting the vast need for affordable and deeply affordable housing. Um, I know you you came to me like literally directly moments after you uh, left at a Department of General Services hearing on okay. uh, school, outstanding school work orders. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, uh, brought up the question in my mind of maintenance that mm -hmm. DC government tends to struggle with maintenance regardless of what kind of terror you know if it's an yeah. office building a school or uh, if it's public housing how um, uh, and again it's bigger bigger than this bill obviously but how would you make sure if these will be district-owned properties that maintenance would would be uh, um, that they'd stay on top of maintenance well, one of the um, features of this bill also is empowering tenants. So we, um, this legislation also empowers tenants to oversee um, management and maintenance. And because housing is mixed income, there will be enough 
re revenue coming in through rents um, to keep the keep the buildings um, in, in good shape. Um, so we sort of see it as uh, that model, which we see with some of our other sort of community land trust and uh, and other um, things that do sort of community model of, of that. So that doesn't negate the need for oversight for us to be vigilant. Um, but I think the system is is designed to work well for tenants. And I almost wonder, given sort of the more intelligent um, uh, design behind um, social housing, if social housing can be sort of a public housing 2.0, and if at some point somehow public housing could be migrated over to social housing, kind of learning the learning the lessons. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work from an ownership standpoint, but it seems like there's a lot of smart lessons going into this that you know, I mean, previous public housing could use. Listen, that's a that's a, a, a big question, and I think it definitely deserves some thought. But I will say that, that public housing residents should have the greater say on whether that happens or not um, in the in the long in the long term. But I do think there will be some lessons and benefits uh, from that we will see from social housing that absolutely uh, can inform how we do. Uh, public housing. Um, again, talking about some of the things, you know, when I study sociology, like concentration of poverty, not having mixed mixed income housing actually is a detriment and hurts us in the long run. Right. Now let's, uh, let's talk about the bill's trajectory, because you mentioned that there was a very, a very successful well attended right. hearing. Um, but we're days from the council period coming to a close. So how will this bill uh, be reborn? in council period 25 and what what do you see as the uh prognosis for the bill in the long run well um yeah so we had 154 witnesses show up uh great support um we already have uh co-sponsors on the legislation right now we we have um seven of my colleagues already co co-sponsored this legislation um with me um, and more people are excited now that they saw the hearing. Some of my colleagues who were not specifically like interested in signing on for social housing prior, uh, before, and like after the hearing, you know what? I, I'm actually really interested, um, and I think I would actually, I would actually be signed on and be a supporter now. Um, and then we have some new colleagues coming into the council uh, who have voiced their support for social housing. Um, so just adding more help, social housing supporters to the council is a great thing. Um, but I think one of the benefits of the hearing is we heard from everyone. Um, we did not sort of just hear from sort of advocates and just tenants. We heard from experts. We heard from developers like, hey, I think you need to think this part through. Um, we heard from environmental activists who said, I think you should add this piece. Um, and we heard from people who have, you know, do community land trust or public housing and can say, here are the things I think you should fix. So we're excited that we got so much robust feedback and markups uh, to do. So we are going to be working um, uh, over over the break to improve the legislation with the feedback we heard from all various stakeholders, um, and we will be reintroducing it, um, and it's going to be even stronger uh, when we reintroduce it next session. Um, and I think with so so much sort of uh, excitement around it and people really um, get you know getting on board uh, with it, um, I think you know we're going to see progress throughout the council uh, throughout this council period. I think I think we will be able to get it passed. I also think. Uh, within the budget, we can be able to try to figure out a pilot that can happen uh, uh, as, as soon as we need it to do, to do so we can prove how much of a model this can actually work for DC. Uh, there, are there any other aspects of the legislation, um, any other lessons learned from the hearing that, that we haven't touched on through the questions? Um, you know, I think... We've covered, you know, the the, the green piece of it, um, but I think uh, one of the things is going to be, I think, that that is going to come up is is talking about, you know, how we why this is necessary from a different landscape because obviously we need affordable housing, um, but one thing that came up and we we haven't talked about is sort of the reason why we need social housing is because of the fact that we have so many uh, we we need workers to stay in district government. We have so many vacancies district government wide. Um, and then we, you know, we have people who, who, who are leaving. We also have a high rate, we're having a high rate 
um, of people leaving. And the number one answer for why people are not coming to work here or are leaving is because of affordable housing, um, because the lack of affordable housing. So I see social house, this Green New Deal for social housing, not as sort of just confronting the housing crisis, but really this impacts all of us because when we don't have government workers, right? When we don't have bus drivers, when we don't have, a, when we don't have enough people to drive our kids to school also, these are places where we're seeing shortages and not having enough people. When we talk about social workers and not having enough to staff our schools or DBH. Um, you know, every agency has talked about uh, not having enough uh, workers to work and stay. And the reason why we're losing them to other jurisdictions is because of the lack of affordable housing. So I just think the one piece that I also tell people to think about is it's not just, you know, creating mixed income housing in a way, but it's also creating a community where, like, I grew up, my, my uh, history teacher lived across the street, um, two doors down was a uh, Mr. Lawrence was a bus driver, was a WMATA bus driver, um, and it was a special place because everyone, my next door neighbor was literally a retired uh, school teacher. And so having the this housing is also about making sure we can create a sustainable city and having having the workforce we need to to make our city run well. Right. I mean, what, what's what's the point in attempting to improve the city if the folks that were here um, in the days, uh, you know, uh, in earlier days, don't get to stick yeah. around for it. And if the people that are working hard to make it a better city and government, again, can't stick around and, yeah. and uh, enjoy it. Yeah. So even if you're someone who owns a home and is taken care of in that regard, you still have a stake in making sure we have good, reliable government services. And that's only possible if enough D.C. government workers can afford to live in D.C. so they can they can serve our communities. Um, and uh, feel free to no comment this, but in the transition to council period 25, is housing something that you would be, because you will be uh, graduating to committee chairmanship uh, in council period 25, I know at long last. Is, long is housing last. something that you've uh, thrown your hat in the ring for? Um, I actually did throw my hat in the ring for housing, but it wasn't my... It wasn't in my, I, it wasn't, I did a, I did a top, I did a top I four. Um, you, th you threw a hat, but not the hat. Exactly. That is, <laughs> that is actually the accurate way to say that. I love that. <laughs> uh, excellent. So we're, we're done with the serious stuff. I have one random question and then we'll do a little fun close out like we did right. last interview and, and then we'll be all done. Um, so I was noticing, it took me almost two years to notice this, that uh, with the exception of you and Councilmember Henderson, all of the female council members, their nameplate on the dais says Ms. and their last name. And I saw that you and Councilmember Henderson have Mrs. Yes. And I didn't know if that was just an administrative snafu, that's the way they showed up, or if you all requested them. I just thought that was an interesting distinction. That, no, that was administrative. We, I, when I saw it, I was like, Oh, that's a long, it was Mrs. It was long, but yeah, we, it's sort of administrative snafu, but my husband loves it. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> uh, now, now our fun, you'll remember uh, from last time, our fun closeout was we were ranking dessert categories. That's right. Um, this time, uh, which I think is even more popular with council members, is I'm going to give you a random task, and I want you to tell me which of your colleagues, council period 24 colleagues, you think would be best suited to the task and why? Oh my goodness, this is fun. Okay, and I assure ahead. you, they're they're, ran, they're random tasks, and okay. I'll, I'll let you know kind of what what feedback I've gotten from those. Um, the first one is assembling IKEA furniture. You and a colleague need to put a bookshelf together. What colleague would you draft for the job? I'm going to do Robert White. Um, he has two daughters, so he has to put together dream houses, dream boats. I think he has some experience in this area. <laughs> yep, yep, he's, he's been mentioned before. The chairman, the chairman gets mentioned yes. uh, on this one a lot. Um, how about uh, driving cross country? You're stuck in a car for thousands of miles. Who would you want to do that? This is so with? tough. Driving across country? Yep. 
can be someone who you just think you wouldn't kill or it could be someone who you want to get to know more about. Honestly, I think it would be me and Christina. We have the same music taste. So we love concerts and music. So I think, you know, we're both, you know, Beyonce is going on concert next year. If you didn't know, um, we're already ready. Rihanna's going to be at the Super Bowl. So I think it would be council member Henderson because we would jam all the way through. We sort of have similar music taste. So I'm going to go with Christina there. I would absolutely watch that reality TV show. <laughs> It'd be good. <laughs> yeah, I would watch that in a heartbeat. Um, how about uh, cooking up a feast? Ooh, cooking up a feast. I wish one of my colleagues can actually cook. Um, I, know, I think it would be fun to cook with Mary Che. <laughs> yeah. It, it's <laughs> funny. This question, it made a lot yeah. more sense before COVID. Because council members got to mix more kind of off, you know, behind the scenes. And with COVID, it, everyone's been kind of at home. So I, but, yeah. I think I think Mary Jane would have great commentary while cooking, have some tidbits. Um, and she already drops off pies for council members for the holiday. So it, it's a natural, natural choice there. That's that is true. That is true. Um, how about. Uh, well, I was going to say compiling a musical playlist, but you already answered that one. Um, who would you who would you like to bring home to meet your family? Meet my family. Um, Treyon. Uh, my family and Treyon families are pretty much like probably the same. <laughs> so <laughs> my fa I would bring home Treyon. He is always fun, always a blast, always, always making me laugh. Um, we're both DC natives and DCPS graduates. So he, our families probably have stories for days. We, they probably went to school together. <laughs> All yeah. So definitely try on. Yeah, that would that would go down smooth. Uh, <laughs> now, how about uh, we'll do two more? Filing your taxes. Oh, oh Phil, no brainer. Phil phone yeah. taxes. His attention to detail. Um, he would also make sure I got some. Made sure I I took all the exemptions I needed to take. Maybe give me some, uh, give me some bonus credits in there. I, I would absolutely trust trust Phil to do my tax. Gotcha. <laughs> and the absolute last one, and my favorite, is fighting off barbarians. Uh, Alyssa, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we could both be like ready to go <laughs> uh, together. She'd be like, "You got it. I got this. You got that." I think we both would be relentless to the end. So, uh, Alyssa, for sure. I would. I would also watch that reality show. It would and, be good. <laughs> And that's another one where Mary Che gets a lot of votes. <laughs> that, that makes so, sense also. <laughs> so we, we, we got to hope for no barbarians in, uh, in council period uh, 25, since we're losing that's true. our, our that's two true. best barbarian fighters. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for humoring me for my fun little game. Um, it yeah. always goes over well. Council members always start off kind of nervous when I say I it's going oh, no. to be. And then they're like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. I, Appreciate you doing it, awesome. uh, but we are unfortunately out of time. We had a couple other topics. Hopefully, I can bring you back uh, right. whenever yeah. you're here. I'm here uh, to tackle those. I, I need you to do one with all the freshmen. At, all the freshmen. We no longer be freshmen, but like me, Christina, and Brooke should do one together as we're transitioning into our, our committees. Um, you can get first would, impressions on committees and all of that. I'd love that. We we've had one one or two guests appear on shows. Uh, okay. Council members showed up with people, um, but I've not done a multi council member one, so I'm I'm here for it. We um, we do well together. We do a lot of them together, so it'd be fun. Oh yeah, I could I could I could tell you guys are thick as thieves. I could see all behind the dais <laughs> laughing it up. I wish <laughs> That's I. That's true. Sorry. <laughs> I wish I could get the soundtrack of that. Sometimes we just got the option of whether we wanted to move seats because you know finally. You know, we're, we're moving on up, and they were like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanna, Do you want to move seats? Because now you you have um, priority." And we were like, "No, we're sticking together." <laughs> no, 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 no. I think those edge seats are the good seats because they're that's where quality. You get away with, quality. <laughs> get away with nonsense. That's right. Uh, well, thank you again, very, very much for your time. I appreciate yes. it. Um, thank you, listeners. Uh, remember to subscribe to our podcast on SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search under Hearing the Council. Thank you again, Council Member, for joining us. Thank you, listeners. Tune in next time. We're on DC Radio at 96.3 on your FM HD4 dial or at DCRadio.gov. I'm Josh Gibson.
This is not a council hearing. This is hearing the council. Thanks again. Take care, council member. Thank you. Bye-bye.